Now it is time to kick off the day and I'm very happy to hand over to Alexander Thiel, partner at McKinsey and Company, who helps consumer goods, retail, luxury and other clients to sustainably grow the top and bottom line with his extensive knowledge in commercial growth. And he will be joined by former top athlete and now president and CEO of the World Federation of the Sports Good Industry, Robert de Kock. They will give us an insight on what will be the next normal in sports. Welcome and good morning. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, yes, let us jump in immediately as our time is short for today. Okay. And let me, start, let me start by saying that we will uh, be giving a, I would say, snapshot of the future of the sporting goods industry and what it could look like. You get a small snapshot on the past, but I think the past is less interesting than the future. Uh, it's the first time that the sporting goods industry and the WFSGI and McKinsey have a collaboration uh, on uh, making a global sporting goods report. Uh, we're very pleased with the number of uh, uh, participants in this report, and we're therefore also very pleased to, uh, to give this also further to you. And for all participants and listeners, um, the report can be downloaded. Uh, and you have access to an 80-page report on the sporting goods industry on eight, I would say, main elements uh, out of our industry that are of, of major importance. Um, before um, uh, going further, I would like to give the word then also to Alexander, who will give you a quick glance over some of the topics. And unfortunately, out of the eight, we have made a selection for today. But again, we will be available for further information that you would need. Alexander, I give the word and I move the slides. Alexander, we can um, also from my side, right, a very warm welcome. My name is uh, Alexander. I'm a partner with McKinsey, indeed, based out of Zurich with over 10 years of experience serving sporting good brands, retailers and manufacturers. And as Robert, I truly believe that we are at a real inflection point for the industry, which always represents opportunities, but also significant challenges. By the events of the last year have accelerated numerous developments and a new normal, we believe, is taking shape in the industry. And we want to talk to you today about what this new normal will mean for the industry. Um, if you go to uh, the next page exactly, over the, uh, over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll walk you very, very briefly through a kind of executive summary of the report. And afterwards, we'll then deep dive into some specific aspects like digital sustainability, retail and supply chain, all done um, quite fast. We want to start with a super brief look back at 2020. You all know what happened as a result of depressed household incomes, closed shops, lockdowns, the sporting goods market contracted globally by around 7%. That pain was spread fairly equally across the continents. Um, the one exception, of course, being China, which recovered much faster and saw its market share rise. Not every company was affected the same. Roughly two-thirds of companies posted declining sales. A number of companies, if you can just go back one slide, Robert. Um, a number of companies were more positive because they were positioned in pockets of growth. Overall, if you look at the industry, and that's what you see on this slide, the industry actually outperformed, if you want, its benchmark of the apparel industry, recovering faster after the initial drop and actually achieving higher market capitalization from September 2020 onwards compared to December 19. So now, um, if you go to the next slide and we shift and look not back, but ahead to 2021. We want to start with a very brief view of what 130 leading sporting goods executive said that we ask in our WFSGI McKinsey survey. And as you see here, the overall sentiment for 2021 is much more positive, with over 60% saying they expect business conditions to improve and just 6% thinking things might get even worse. Of course, this is a relative question and almost certainly a reflection of how challenging things have been in 2020. We also asked the executives, even though we don't show it here in detail, on their outlook category by category, and their belief which we share is that categories that did well in 2020 are expected to remain on a high. I'm talking here, of course, about home sports, 
uh, activities more easily undertaken during pandemic, like biking, running, and yoga, and generally speaking, individual sports. Other categories might are likely to make a partial recovery too, but at a lower rate. With this quickly out of the view, out of the um, way, and if we go to the next page, we now want to come to the heart of the report. Um, the heart of the report is our view of the next normal in sporting goods that we see taking shape. And we highlight here eight key themes set to shape the sporting goods industry in 2021 and beyond. I'll now give you a very, very brief overview of those, and then we'll deep dive into a few select trends for in a few minutes each. On the top, you see three main consumer shifts that we think are absolutely crucial. Number one, at leisure. Of course, a mega trend before COVID. However, the pandemic has further blurred the lines between work and free time. However, what has also happened is that at leisure is increasingly becoming a real battleground with many mainstream fashion brands entering the segment. Um, we believe sporting goods players really need to leverage their innovation abilities and their market knowledge in order to keep winning in this critical arena. And in our report, we outline a few possible strategies. Second is what we call the physical activity gap. We all know from empirical data that unfortunately, physical activity is generally lower in lower income brackets. The current crisis is not only health, but also economic crisis, and many more households are driven into lower income brackets. So this gap could widen, and we believe it's a multi-stakeholder approach is needed, in, including the industry, to um, address this. And then third, sustainability, something we'll look at in more detail in a few seconds. So I won't say much here, but sustainability, we think, has now reached a point where it's not only something for a niche, but it needs to be able to reach scale. And sustainability at scale will have some significant challenges. The next line that you see, we talk about three trends that we have put under the header of digital leap. The first one, number four, is digital enabled fitness and exercise communities. We have seen, of course, during the pandemic, and you're all aware of that, a boom of digital fitness solutions that provide both inspiration for exercise, but also, and maybe more importantly, a sense of community when you can go to your favorite gym, so on. And what we have seen is that going forward, people, even when they will return to their favorite gym, plan to use these solutions in a kind of hybrid model. And we think it's critical for the industry to offer such solutions, partner with them, and then also link them to their own sales and revenue channels, something we look at detail in our report. Number five, the leap forward online, something we'll look at in more detail in a few minutes. Of course, we've seen a leap forward in online shopping in 2020. Um, many first-time users who we believe will have the habit stick. So companies really need to accelerate the migration from wholesale to e-commerce and direct to consumer, putting digital commerce at the center of business models. And then the last part, part, part of this digital leap is on the marketing side, where we see and predict an increasing shift from asset to influencers. With people spending more time online, many sports events canceled, we think that brands need to find new ways to engage online beyond simple advertisement. And that will be through influencers, in many cases, individual athletes. However, this also means that it will be critical for brands to identify such individual athletes and ambassadors that not only can reach their target customers, but are also aligned with the brand values, something that is new for many. And finally, at the bottom, we see two major industry disruptions, which we think are also critical for the next normal. One being retail under pressure, and I don't need to tell you that, of course, brick and mortar stores had a horrible year. But more importantly, what is the role of retail in a future that is more digital and more omnichannel? We think it's critical, but it needs to redefine its purpose on an outlet by outlet level. And finally, supply chain. No question, more agility is needed here. And in a post-COVID world but characterized by shorter demand cycles, e-commerce, more direct to consumer, this is even more true. And we'll look in a few minutes what this will look like. If we stay for just a few more seconds on a macro picture and go to the next slide, um, what will this new normal mean for the industry and for companies? There is an old saying, in times of uncertainty, fortunes are more easily made and lost. And we believe this is true in the next certainly coming few years. Um, we think there will be 
winners and losers and a starker polarization than we have seen before. And we think there are a few key markers of who will be in the winner category and who will be not. And we have listed them here on the left. Strong presence in growing segments um, like women, like at leisure, like China, like individual sports, like running and biking, an excellent direct-to-consumer model, direct to connection com to consumers, to digital communities, a really purpose-driven retail footprint, credibility and sustainability, and a roadmap to achieving sustainability at scale, supply chain with built-in agility, sports marketing optimized for digital channels with more emphasis on individual influencers, and agility and planning and budgeting to respond more quickly. We believe that players that will embrace and embody these attributes will enter a virtuous cycle shown on this page, while players without um, winning solutions in these areas may find themselves in a vicious cycle of losing relevance, losing sales, um, losing margins, and thereby having less and less funds for investments. And many of these areas will require investment. So that is a super brief overview of the key messages of our report. Now we'll deep dive into a few subjects in more detail. And for this, I hand over to Robert to talk about sustainability. Robert, thank are you mute? Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. Yes, I am I'm there. I, uh, I have the same challenge as you, pushing the right button. Um, and as you said, uh, we have to be very fast. So it is unfortunately, uh, I recommend everybody again to read the report and to go into this. But sustainability is a nest subject. subject. Uh, sustainability, I think Alex mentioned it before, 67% of the consumers are considering uh, uh, buying products uh, or making the decision of buying products based on sustainability. Um, and this is based on the product. Obviously, sustainability goes much further than that. We talk about supply chain, sustainable supply chain. We talk about sustainable production. Um, we talk about sustainable companies. And we talk about walk the, uh, walk the talk. Um, those kind of elements become important in the future for companies uh, to really uh, make sure that they uh, live up to the sustainability needs and requirements uh, that are going around. Um, what we have seen as well, and uh, this you see in this chart, we see slowly also a stronger demand coming up. Uh, we saw a big growth for 58% per annum in the last three years already, um, growing it up to 72,000 SKUs already uh, being part of the sustainable uh, product site. Um, but we do have a lot of challenges still ahead of us. Um, it doesn't mean really always if a product is sustainable coming to our territories uh, that the whole chain is sustainable. So there's a lot of work to be done. But we also have challenges when it comes to the products themselves and the other products that we're working on. And how many products can we make sustainable today? We do have limitations on materials, on raw materials. Um, uh, so there are other thoughts, processes that have to come in place to make a product sustainable. Um, circular is, uh, is, is definitely a, a thought to do, but we also have to make sure that governments and uh, uh, regions are working and, and playing the same game because we need also facilities to recycle. We need facilities to, uh, to make sure that materials can be reused and how to be reused. Um, so there's a lot of challenges, I would say, in our, uh, in our area of sustainability. But it is a must. It is something where the consumer is going to be very sensitive about and uh, where we see a, a, a serious need and a demand. Now, some of these challenges lay simply also the availability of the materials today. Where we saw the industry making a lot of progress in the last years was definitely in the packaging side. Um, uh, is it by using other materials that are easy recyclable uh, or fully recyclable even? Um, but those are the challenges that we have. But we still, like I said, we have still a problem and challenge also for the future. Uh, by 2025, we want to have 25% of our products sustainable. We need five times more materials as we have today available. So we need to make sure how we can get this, how we can get access to those materials or how we can produce those materials. Um, that will be a, a, a clear challenge uh, for the industry in the next uh, I would say, few years. Uh, but it is also a must when it comes to the investment uh, potential, and it is also a must for the consumer potential uh, to make sure that uh, that uh, that uh, this is uh, effect. 
So the wave of recycling and reusing is coming, uh, as we indicate also in the report. Um, and I hope that everybody will prepare themselves if they have not already done so. Uh, we've seen many companies already reacting to this uh, in the past. Um, Alex, I'm giving further to you to land into the next slide of uh, the digital. Yes, and I'll um, keep myself brief. Uh, leap forward and online. Of course, you all know that COVID-19 related stock closures really lifted the online growth curve to a new level. But it is worth looking at this in more detail to particularly answer the question, how will this look going forward? Um, first of all, it's important to note, and you see this on the page, that this digital first trend is strongest among younger consumers. 84% uh, of Generation Z, so people born between 96 and 2010, who had not previously shopped online, started to do so during the pandemic. Uh, also in baby boomers, 20%, um, almost 20% um, who had not done, been online before dipped their toes into digital for the first time. And then the, uh, it's relevant that across all these groups, there is a similar level of determination to make this change stick with intended net migration away from physical channels running at around 10 to 15 percent across the board. Um, we have a lot of additional data um, backing this up. A recent McKinsey survey shows that, in in that this shift really is permanent for many consumers. Always around 30% uh, of respondents say that they will significantly reduce their physical channels going forward, even though it was their primary one before. So the simple message is that shift to online uh, will be roughly, will be permanent for many and habits have been changed for good. And if we go to the next page, and as a result, we have run the numbers, putting all this together, and we therefore expect online penetration in the industry in 2021 to stabilize around 25%. That is six times higher than a pre-COVID level. In spite of this really significant change in the channel landscape, the question is, of course, how should sporting goods companies respond? Um, we think it's really critical to, I think there's some background noise, sorry. Don't go mute. We, uh, there's really a fundamental shift here needed to now change significantly from a primary wholesale model to a primary digital and where possible direct to consumer approach, which will of course require significant business model transformation. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, it's necessary to ramp up digital capabilities, elevating e-commerce, embracing direct to consumer model and combining the best of digital and physical. So with that, um, let me go on, and if we go on the next page, to talk a bit about retail, which of course is under pressure, but we believe a critical mix of the future channel mix. We are running out of time, so I'll just say, ten, um, retail, we believe, will stay important, but really needs to have a clear purpose, outlet by outlet. You see on the right some purposes that we have defined, and what is necessary for the industry, I think, is review each location separately and define what the best purpose for it is and how it can interlink more seamlessly uh, and cons customer centrically with the digital offering space. Um, with that, back to you, Robert, to say a final word about supply chain. Thank you, and I will try to be brief as well. Um, uh, let's be honest, I think uh, supply chain was uh, quite under stress during uh, the, the closing period and, and, and still is slightly factory closures, uh, uh, retail closures. Um, so it wasn't very easy to work on this. Uh, we did see that some of the industry people were prepared for it and uh, have been able to react. Is it through the e-commerce platforms? Is it the direct to consumer um, aware, where you saw certain brands, I would say, make a huge step forward? Um, already the whole system as direct to consumers, I would say, was boosted by two years where uh, e-commerce was boosted by four years and you saw there some clear winners like on the slide here also Lululemon who really made a huge leap uh, uh, forward uh, in this area but also brands like Nike and Adidas uh, did, did very well in these areas. Um, some of the challenges that we will see and that we'll see in the near future is simply also the speed of production, the speed of delivery, the service of delivery, um, uh, the possibilities of uh, um, um, reducing stock 
and how to do that. So you will have to see that people have to start thinking about the elements of, of, uh, of offshore, nearshoring, or, or onshoring, uh, meaning where to produce, which products to produce where, and to be much smarter, I would say, in the elements of, uh, of uh, uh, production uh, places, but also the stock, the, the management of, uh, of, uh, of needs also. Uh, so the whole system supply chain will, uh, uh, will be changing, will be changing dramatically. Uh, and I think this needs a whole uh, reinvestigation from the different companies. And we see already that bigger players are already ahead of the game. Uh, smaller players may not be yet ready for it, but we recommend you very strongly also to go into this and read the report also to get further information. And as Alex said, we are a little bit on the time stress, so we would move forward straight away to the session of questions and answers. And I head back to the studio. Robert Alexander, thank you so much for this great start to the day of our fitness and health day and for showing us where we stand and where we are going. I have one question from the audience for you. What product categories will mostly be purchased online? Equipment as opposed to apparel? Shall I, Alex? I'll make a start. <laughs> yeah, not an, not an uh, easy question to answer. Generally, um, we see uh, uh, online not stopping from any category, but um, so I don't, we don't expect any, any significant um, differences there. Of course, what we do see is that certain categories are benefiting more from let's say the more individual and working out at home trends. I mentioned at the top of the tree, um, right? Home sports, everything you need to equip your home and recast your home as a gym, um, individual sports like biking, running and, and yoga and all kinds of outdoor sports. So we expect those to benefit particularly. In generally, we see n uh, people having no problem of also ordering equipment online. Of course, it is important for um, a companies that ship equipment um, making sure that with return policies in place um, uh, you don't get battered on margins when people then return uh, uh, equipment products which of course um, uh, carry higher shipment fees but generally we think the online boom will cover and continue to cover all categories thank you and you said the digital shift is already happening and will continue. Do you feel that the sporting goods industry is ready for this shift on what would be the most crucial piece of advice you'd give? Um, well, I'll start in Robert Ed. Look, for me, it's the most crucial piece of advice. This is also a cultural transformation. Um, if you think about your company and you envision it a few years from now where maybe you've gone from 10% e-commerce and a few percent direct to consumer to 30% e-commerce and 20% direct to consumer, that company will also be a different one uh, culturally. It will require new capabilities, new mindsets, new ways of doing business. So don't underestimate the level of change that this will require, not only in where you sell, but how your whole business model works and how you also understand yourself as a company. Thank you so much, Robert and Alexander, and thank you for this great piece of advice. Thank you for being here today. Thank you also. Have a nice one. Bye-bye. Thank you.